any conversation about the role of technology supplanting humans is about a profound misunderstanding of what being human is about. Because technology essentially removes you from the chore that made you subhuman or made you a worker. And you know, this was a big problem with industrialization in which we became the machine. Hello and welcome to PolyWeb. I'm your host, Sara Landi Tortoli, and my guest today is Alexander Mano, professor, celebrated author, and consultant for Fortune 500 companies, governments, uh, and academic institutions. This conversation sits at the intersection between human creativity and technology, and how to leverage both to create something meaningful. So, enjoy this episode. So, Alexander, what is the end of the beginning? The end of the beginning is a phase in the development or the uh, adoption of any technology in which the equipment, uh, the hardware, is now mainstream at an acceptable price and everybody has access to it. So then the uh, hardware and software, which was the case with the, uh, the PC introduction, which essentially from 81 to 85, by 85 everybody had some sort of a PC on their desk, everybody meaning the workforce. Most of the activities were transitioned on the PC using software. And uh, most people were able to work, not fluently as much as they would have wanted, in both spreadsheets and Word programs, for example. So then they, that's the end of the beginning because the beginning meant everybody now has the equipment. So now the question becomes, what else can this equipment do? What else can I use it for? Can I design with it? Sure. So then we have AutoCAD, and then we have PageMaker, and PowerPoint, and presentation devices, and then we have Adobe Illustrator. So that meant, if you imagine what that meant, right? That meant that now every school has to teach skills connected to a technology they don't control. And every school has to teach people to develop themselves into essentially utensils of the computer rather than the other way around. Because now they need to learn how to work with computers and they don't control the development of the hardware or the software, which means that their skills have to be upgraded all the time, all the time, all the time. So the end of the beginning is a phase that is profoundly transformative because from that moment it demands a different level of efficiency and effectiveness. And you can, you can parallel this with generative AI. Right now, essentially what happened in 2023, it was the end of the beginning for generative AI in the form of Midjourney, DALI, ChatGPT, and so on. And everybody seems to be shocked, like, whoa, we have artificial intelligence. No, artificial intelligence has been in stealth mode for 25 years. Just like most technologies, just like the internet. The internet was, was in stealth mode, which means it was not seen commercially but it was used by people in the academia and the military since 65. And it emerged all of a sudden in full surface, you know, in 1991. Why? Because somebody invented a friendly way of addressing it and because we already had the end of the beginning, which meant everybody now had the tool to access the, uh, the internet. So it was no longer restricted to institutions. So same thing happens to ChatGPT. Everybody has a word program of some sort in which they have to perform uh, written tasks. Why wouldn't I use ChatGPT? <laughs> like, since you, the employer, is asking me to create reports, why do I have to create a report when I can ask ChatGPT to create a report on the parameters I'm interested in? So everybody seems to be shocked right now that they have to adapt to a technology. No, there's nothing new. We adapted to technology for thousands of years. That's why we create technology. We create technology to change our life. And then we, then we buy a vacuum cleaner and then we vacuum for 75 years. Guess who's vacuuming? You. The vacuum cleaner is actually sucking dirt. The verb vacuuming is you, <laughs> the human. So then you have the iRobot who's vacuuming. And then you go, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> Look at this thing vacuuming. Yeah. Did it take your job? No, it took your chores. So people confuse work with labor. Work creates artifacts of memory, the Taj Mahal. Labor creates 
nuts and bolts. So do I want to make nuts and bolts or the Taj Mahal? I want the nuts and bolts to be made by a machine and the Taj Mahal to be made by ideally a machine as well, <laughs> but designed by me. So then you see how if we start realizing what is the purpose of technology, the purpose of technology is profoundly human and is profoundly a derivative of our needs and wants, which is essentially saying technology is what we desire. Now, why do we desire it? Because it gives us convenience. Why do we want convenience? Because we want to hibernate like the big bears. We want the lowest energy state. And for that reason, we invented pillows and blankets and beds. We sleep in a bed. <laughs> Not only that, but we want our cats and dogs to sleep in the bed. We buy beds for dogs. Whoa. Is that civilization? Yes, it is. So then you realize that in the moment in which you start understanding what being human is about, it's not about labor, it's not about being in line to buy a product, it's not about going to the supermarket or the uh, department store. It's about composing music. It's about painting. It's about watching paintings, which is profoundly human and the only thing that cats and dogs don't do. <laughs> in terms of... What animals don't do, they don't create art, we do. So we are contemplative animals. <clears throat> That's the best way to, to explain it. So we are essentially conditioned to contemplation. How are we doing so far? <laughs> and you asked just one question, so. <laughs> there is a lot to unpack in yeah, this yeah. and a few rabbit holes that we can explore together. Sure. But I think that what you say, it's interesting. And at the same time, I would like to challenge that in a sense, right? Not because I don't agree with you, I do, but because I think that, you know, a huge source of meaning today, it's actually work, the work that we do, or at least it feels that way. Maybe it's true there is a distinction between labor and work, right? But if before we we found meaning uh, in religion, you know, and uh, in worshiping gods, today we have lost uh, largely this divine sense of meaning, at least. And therefore, work has become largely the way that we define ourselves, the way that we define success, for example, right? So yeah. if you think about, if I ask you right now, who do you think is a successful person? Most people will tell me something like Steve Jobs, Elon Musk. No, I'll say the Dalai Lama. Way more successful than Steve Jobs. Yeah, arguably, yeah. right? I guess it depends on, on your definition, but I believe you are an outlier. No, actually, I'm using, I'm using Steve Jobs' definition. <laughs> 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 Who wanted to meet the Dalai Lama, right? Like Steve Jobs was a Buddhist. True. True. So, you know, anyway, give me your devil's advocate, advocate position on this. Sure. So how can we be contemplative, you know, and push towards the, the arts, uh, let's say, composing music, uh, painting, writing, etc. If uh, a huge source of our meaning uh, comes from work. No, right? uh, uh, I, I disagree with that statement. On the surface, it looks like a huge source of meaning comes from your work. On, on the surface. And that may be true because you have lost your sense of purpose, not you. The people in which, for which work is their meaning do not have another purpose because they haven't read any book that confirms anything for them. They've been essentially indoctrinated by a system that told them that your meaning is to go to a phase of life in which you grow, and once you grow, you become an adult, and once you become an adult, your purpose is to create things for society, which means work. So that was an indoctrination that doesn't happen in every uh, culture. It happens in our culture, but it doesn't happen in... in I will probably suggest that in less than half of the population of the world, this, this exists, less than half. And the reason it exists is because we, for example, in our, in my students' body or 
colleagues and so on, professionals, but they have never read a, a treatise of human nature by David Hume, which means they don't know why people do things. They never read The Sense of Beauty by George Santayana, which means they don't know why people find pleasure in beautiful things and why uh, beauty is an extra sense of humans, the, the sixth sense, right? And why do we have 60,000 museums on the planet, more than anything else, right? You realize we have museums which do nothing. You know what they, their purpose is? To host a painting or a sculpture. You know what the purpose of painting or sculpture is? For you to go and look at it. And then you travel to Paris and you go to the Louvre. And you tell me that your meaning is your work. No, your meaning is to make money to go to the Louvre. <laughs> In the end. <laughs> so then, they have never read The Human Condition by Hannah Arendt that explains labor, work, and vita activa, the active life. So they don't understand that labor is about life itself, so you put food on the table, but work is to create a distinctive, different thing from nature, which is the Taj Mahal. And then you realize, wait a second, where does the Taj Mahal come from, from in the idea of my work is my meaning? No, my work is to create meaning, which is different. So that is real work. And that doesn't mean that that's my job, right? So, so that's another confusion between work and your job. So of course I, I, I'm passionate about what I do, and it's my meaning, and it's my destiny. But I don't call it uh, labor. I call it work, and it's the kind of work in my defin in Hannah Arendt's definition of work, which is worldly creating worldliness, right? Creating the extraordinary. And people say, yeah, the machine will replace me. Absolutely, it will replace you, and good for it. And guess what you are going to do? You're going to do nothing or create worldliness. You are either going to accept the fact that you are not meant to work for money, and people are very confused also by the idea, but if the machine replaces me, where does the money come from? Do you know where the money comes from? So here's the thing. It's a very simple thing that people don't understand. Corporation, individual, right? Individual hired by the corporation. The individual makes stuff. The stuff goes to the market. The market sells it, the money goes to the corporation and the government in tax. The corporation gives you the money. Then you are replaced by the machine. The machine makes three times more than you do because it's more efficient. So in the market, you have three more things which make more money, which goes to the corporation, which goes to the government, which gives you basic income. And the corporation still makes a lot of money. So everybody makes the profit they made actually way more than before. And nobody works, let's say, and the machine serves the purpose of the machine for which people invent machines. <laughs> the purpose for which we invent machines. <laughs> so, so the thing is, if you confu confuse the meaning of life with your work, then I'm really sorry for the, well, unless the work is painting, music, or, you know, the work that actually is defined as creating the extraordinary, or in other words, the distinctive thing which nature doesn't have, that thing that the, the Hannah Arendt definition, then if that's how you define your life throughout through the work in that definition, that's fantastic. And then you realize that life is about contemplation. And if you look at the definition of contemplation, well, I have a chapter in my previous book, the ending of the book is the contemplative interval, which is what I think the next thing is. The next disruption is uh, the contemplative interval because we have technology that will take care of everything else and this is where people need to learn how to contemplate like they physically need to learn how to let go of things and, and understand that contemplation has a lot of dimensions of meaning and then they, if you find meaning in contemplation you go whoa that's amazing I never knew I could contemplate like that <laughs> how do you contemplate then if that's the, the end goal, the end purpose. I have rules. I have. You, okay. <laughs> no, I have, no, I have a whole a presentation I give about the contemplative interval, the idea of contemplation. So I can send them to you. I don't know if it's because it, it takes, there are about 30 different ways to, to set your mind. Okay. So it's like so a separate I, rabbit hole. Sorry? 
it's like a separate rabbit hole like yes it's a, <laughs> it's a it's actually a thing by itself in my view okay so and I, it's worth it's actually worth discussing at one point but it's worth discussing on its own because you don't want to confuse it with you know People might confuse it with, uh, when I say contemplation, people go immediately into spiritual stuff and without understanding what spiritual means, and they go into religion. And that's not what this is about. Okay, I'd love to explore this, but let's leave it uh, aside for one second, and maybe if we have time, we'll revisit it later. Sure. Because what you're telling me right now, you know, is that, like, work... In the Anna Arendt definition, you know, that like that is creating the extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So mostly it's tied to the concept of the arts, right? Of human creativity is the new definition of meaning, or it has always been the definition of meaning for men. But what happens when AI does this uh, better, you know, than uh, a human itself? Because Generative AI, and that's how we started the conversation. Mm -hmm. It's all about inserting a prompt and Dali or Midjourney can produce a painting <laughs> that is better than most humans mm -hmm. can do. Some AI application can produce music, right? They can produce entire videos. Uh, like soon they're going to be as good as an entire Hollywood crew production, you know? So what happens when also that is taken away? Well, that's what my last book is about. It's called Transcending Imagination, AI, and the Future of Creativity. So let's, let's define what is art or what is design or what is the thing that we call. First of all, what we call art is the end result. We don't call art the, pro the process. Uh, same thing in, in design. Uh, essentially, we had this mistake for many years in calling, and we make this mistake with many things. We make this mistake with the word innovation. We think innovation is a process. No, innovation is an outcome. The process is design. So we make that kind of mistake with art as well. The object is art. The building is art. The process of that building is architecture. So uh, Taj Mahal is art. And the process of getting there was architecture. So we have a thing called the manifestation. So that's what we see, right? Our senses see the manifestation. How do we get to the manifestation? So what, what Dali produces or Mid Journey produces is the manifestation, right? We agree on this. All right. How do we get to the manifestation? Well, we have two other things. Intent and articulation. They intend to create something and the articulation of creating something, which now we call the prompt. But in the past, it was just an abstract definition of what do I want to paint? So the thing is, there is a famous painting in Canada, famous because it was very controversial, Barnett Newman. It's called The Voice of Fire. And if you look at The Voice of Fire, it's a gigantic painting, which was bought by the National Gallery of Ottawa, of Canada in Ottawa. It's a very, very large painting, a few meters tall, and it's essentially a blue background with an orange stripe. So it's blue and orange, one stripe of orange. I think they paid at the time $2 million. Today it's worth $50 million or so. And then the people started writing newsletters, news, sorry, letters to the editor complaining how our government spends our money. Because my child could paint that. Yeah, your child can paint a blue background with a orange stripe. But Barnett Newman did not paint the blue But Barnett Newman gave an image to the idea of the voice of fire. So he illustrated the voice of fire. It happens that it looks like an orange stripe on a blue background. So the thing is, if you look at art as intention, articulation, and manifestation, which is, you know, <clears throat> David Bohm, famous physicist and philosopher, he looked at the universe as energy, matter, and meaning. In other words, if you don't have meaning, it doesn't exist. 
Who gives meaning to art? Not Dali. You, the human. So you are the sentient part of the equation. And I were I did hundred maybe two hundred thousand images in Mid Journey. Mid Journey would have not done anything without me. It doesn't do it by itself. So I need to have the intent of creating something. I need to be able to articulate what I want to create. And then I will let Mid Journey work with me, just like I did this with Excel spreadsheets. You know what Excel spreadsheet does? Articulates nothing, has no intent. It has a manifestation called the result. You know who does the intent? You. You want to know how much money you have. You know that who does the articulation? You. You enter sums <laughs> in a budget. And then you enter a formula. And all of a sudden, mid journey equal Excel spreadsheet gives you the result. And you are very happy with that. <laughs> and you don't say, hey, this took away people's uh, jobs. How about my desire to make our, our mathematical calculation? How about my kids learning math or not learning math? I mean, uh, what will happen if they don't learn math? What will happen to their life? Oh my God, their life will be a miserable existence. Because now they don't have to divide things by 2,000. Or they don't, have to, they don't know this formula. So we do, we do this all the time. We shortchange what the meaning of life is all the time. Because essentially, any conversation about the role of technology supplanting humans is about a profound misunderstanding of what being human is about. That's what it is. Because it's not about technology. It's about you not understanding, you the human, not understanding the role of technology in your life and why you invented that technology in the first place. And all of a sudden you start saying, hey, let me play the devil's advocate. How about the right of Leonardo DiCaprio to charge $20 million for a movie? You know what? I'm sick and tired of Leonardo DiCaprio. I don't want to see him in every movie. I, w I will have no problem. Don't forget something. Donald Duck was a drawing. <laughs> <laughs> and people were very happy for tens of years to see Donald Duck. That's what I want. I want Donald Duck made by computers. And that's the end of my speech. <laughs> so does technology make us more human or less human? Absolutely more human. Because technology allow most hum human in the human in the in the best definition of human, because it essentially removes you from the chore that made you subhuman or made you a worker. And you know this was a big problem with industrialization, in which we became the machine. And that and that was observed by many people. You know you work. You know Hannah Arendt also talked about this guy who works with a jackhammer. You know crushing asphalt on the street. And he's shaking like this. Is that being human? <laughs> is that what humans are meant to be? Shake? Is the human shaking or is the machine shaking the human? <laughs> so you see that, you know, we go in circles like that, thinking that, and I'll tell and, and it's clear why, okay? Because think of it this way. If I'm saying this technology will replace this, 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 and that, the creativity will be actually enhanced because it's going to be a partnership between people and technology and we'll create things that are transcending our imagination, meaning things we don't even imagine. Okay, that, that's the point of transcending imagination. Imagination, actually, uh, people think imagination is something miraculous. And you know why? Because they don't know what the word means. And, you know, I wrote a book, The Imagination Challenge. People don't know that imagination actually is limited to what you know. You cannot imagine what you don't know. You know, cannot see. It's a, a, imagination creates images of objects or ideas not present to the senses. So it creates it in your mind. So if I say the Statue of Liberty, you see it in your mind because you've seen it before. But if I say Freugel, you see, you see zero. You see nothing. Because you've never seen it, right? So your imagination is limited completely. And, and the expression limited only by your imagination has exactly that meaning limited only by your imagination. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> so the thing is, once you work with Dali, or, or sorry, Mid Journey, and you see what it can produce, 
in a, in a, for example, when you give it a, a, a very intelligent prompt, which is not an archetypical prompt, because that's another issue with people. People ask me, Jenny, design an office chair. Do I need another office chair? Is that a proper use of a new technology, design something that I can design? No. A proper use of a new technology is to do stuff that I've never tried before. So my prompt is, imagine, which is the prompt for me journey, a device that suspends the human body above ground in a, comf in a relatively comfortable position. And then you get something that you cannot possibly imagine yourself. And I have many examples like that in my book. Or, or imagine a device that protects a human from the rain. Don't ask for an umbrella. Try to understand that if you work with what the machine was pre-trained, you get what you can do yourself. But if you ask the machine to do something that is never done before, it will, it will actually dig much deeper into the meaning of the thing and really use artificial intelligence. Yes, you wanted to ask me a question. Sorry. Yeah. How do you train your brain to look for this type of opportunities, right? Uh, to see the unseen or imagine uh, what you have never seen. Okay. You want me to do the contemplation thing right now? Because I think it fits you with your question. Yeah, please. Uh, I love it. So this is called the contemplative interval. And this is like essentially the process by which you convert the human being towards contemplation. Because it's very simple. If you understand that contemplation is something that we are actually born to do, Aristotle has exactly this line. The purpose of action is contemplation. So I was very much inspired actually by, by Aristotle all my life. Interestingly enough, I have read very few philosophy books, but I think I read the right ones. So this is about conceiving ideas about how we ought to live. So it's an activity in which you are reflecting yourself. Oh, interestingly enough, I have the Aristotle quote right here. The purpose of action is contemplation. This is a very profound thing. But as in our conversation, the mere mention of a life of contemplation clashes with the construction of the self and the working individual, which is interesting enough how this fits our conversation. And the working individual is actually ego. It doesn't exist. It's a construct of society. And I was mentioning earlier that this whole idea that we fight technology uh, because it ch challenges every single aspect of our life. Yes, AI will transform education, which is actually a gigantic uh, stakeholder of society. It will ch ch challenge and transform culture, another gigantic <clears throat> stakeholder of society. So, of course, people fight this because it challenges every single notion of what they know. So how can one simultaneously envision a life of contemplation and a life of creative professional achievement? Because that's, that's your question, right? So the hallmark of the artist, designer, entrepreneur, or the visionary is action, the making of something tangible. And this is a th throughout philosophy. People discuss this wildly, whether a life of happiness is the best life for humans. No, happiness, which is different than contemplation, right? Is it possible to reconcile happiness with virtue, which is at Plato right now? The goal of a good life is both to live a life of pleasure. So the thing is, how to, to essentially reconcile virtue and pleasure? Because virtue, pleasure might be seen as a, as a vice, right? And define the, virtue instead. Virtue in the Plato sense, like the, the best of the thing, the virtuous thing to do. Mm hmm Okay. Right. So, so then, so let's read the whole thing from the beginning. Is it possible to reconcile happiness with virtue? The goal of a good life is both to live with pleasure and one of decency. In other words, do not exceed, uh, have excess. Not everything you know is material. There is a spiritual reality. This is what contemplation brings you. The spiritual reality in which you see things that you haven't seen before. In other words, you look at one thing and as if it was the if, first time you see it. And that is a very interesting thing. So here is the line here. Not everything you know is material. There is a spiritual reality. The material is the tool. 
So this is what we create. We create these tools and we think this is the thing. No. The tool is the thing that gives us the spiritual reality. <clears throat> so these are very powerful statements that unfortunately people do not take time to understand in their full impact. The fact that perception is not material. It is a different place. And, and, and you know what's interesting? Everybody has this perception. Like you have it. And, and you know you have it because you see things in your perception and you feel things with your perceptive senses and it's not material. It's a different plane, okay? So when you understand this, you look at life with a new perspective. And then you ask exactly this question, what are you going to do next? And interestingly enough, this was written way before AI became mainstream. This is my previous book, The Philosophy of Disruption. And when I had this moment of clarity that now that AI is coming, what will people do? And, and then I decided to create a pathway of how do we get there? What are we going to do once you have learned all of this? Do you ignore what you know? Do you ignore what you just learned? And you're going to sit in your normal life? Or are you going to engage with the world? This is the critical thing. People like to sit back and be critical of stuff because they don't really want to engage. They think they're engaging by criticizing it. Right? So you must start by waking up and giving yourself to the world. Reality is created by choice. And see, I'm using COVID, <laughs> COVID backdrops because this was during COVID. <laughs> So <clears throat> since, when, yeah, sorry, when you sorry. say give yourself to the word, yeah. what do you mean by that? I mean exactly what it says. I mean embrace it. Don't create a protective strata around you. Don't use an umbrella. Okay. Go in the rain. Okay. Metaphorically, right? Like go okay. in the rain and embrace it. Okay. And give Because see, in the moment in which you step back and you are critical about everything you are seeing, in this case right now means give yourself to AI. That's what I did. I gave myself to mid-journey. And I became a much better... In other words, I, I have assimilated mid-journey in me in the same way in which I assimilated the iPhone. So embrace... And make it part of you. We arm the, yeah, yeah. the new technologies. Yeah, make it, make it part of you just like you made every other technology part of you. Okay. So... And this is, a very, this is the most important statement here. The sensation of who you are is your only permanent reality. This is what contemplation brings you. This, this understanding that what you are sensing right now is, is your only permanent reality. So here's a very simple example. Take your hand and touch the corner of your table in mm -hmm. the middle of your palm. In the middle of your palm, okay. right now. Yeah, you feel the I'm table? It right now. You feel I the do. table? Well, that's you. I do. That, that's not. That's you. That's not the table. You are feeling yourself. You see, yes. like you are feeling. So that's your permanent reality. The rest is ego. In other words, everything else you create are, uh, after that is what you want other people to see. So past, present, and future, they are just words. Oh, that's another thing people discuss all the time. The past doesn't exist future doesn't exist <laughs> so this is the only thing that exists present so time is just a method a means for grasping where people and events begin so this is the thing that i do and that's how you prepare yourself for this interval of of contemplation understand the world that's the whole thing so time is a method where people to measure beginnings and endings Again, something that doesn't exist. What we call the present moment does not exist in the same moment. So the body experiences itself in its own past, all the, always. So everything you are feeling right now just happened. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that an amazing feeling? It just yes, happened. And it, yeah, if you are able to understand that it just happened, but it happened, oh, it happened then, not now, right? <laughs> The now is perpetually fleeting you, right? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's what f the fear is. When you start thinking about these things, you discover what the world is, and that scares people because they are not ready to give themselves to that world because it's too, too much unknown. In your job from 9 to 5, there are many knowns, 
right? This is fascinating. One point, however, to this is that society was not designed to support this. Like, I mean, the way society is structured, the way we define value and value creation, the way the school systems work, right? So the school system is pretty much still geared and structured around or for this type of education. So massive confirmation, right? So everyone is the same. The definition of success is, you know, getting good grades by by memorizing concepts, not really thinking, yeah. just memorize knowledge and then, you know, go into the workforce where the knowledge <laughs> that you got from school barely apply, right? And then grind the nine to five until you retire aged 70 for my generation or above, right? And enjoy, you know, like life then. <laughs> like, so that's the entire system. What you're suggesting right now, it's like a complete shift. Yeah, I'm suggesting that you never become a, an adult, but you grow up. So, which means a grown-up is a grown-up child. An adult is somebody serious. <laughs> so, you know, somebody serious doesn't read The Little Prince, but a grown-up reads The Little Prince every year because it's a book for grown-ups. It's not a book for children. But the grown-up, the, but the adults look at the book and see drawings in it, and they say, hey, this must be a book for children. Because they're drawings, right? <laughs> so the adult, if there were diagrams, then it would be for adults. <laughs> but they're drawings, you know, stars and baobabs. So they say, hey, that must, must be for children. And if you look at the dedication of the, of the book, it says for Leon Roth, when he was a little child. So it's actually dedicated to a grown-up. So that's an interesting thing. So how do you do this? You Exactly how, the way I'm explaining it. You start playing with your mind and you start understanding that play is here and ne never take things too seriously. Not because they are not serious, but because you can actually go through life with uh, this attitude of understanding it as a game and, and extract the best part of it. And I, I don't, I, I'm not critical of things. I smile every day. So that is not because I cannot be critical. But because there's no point in being critical of the rain, you know, like, just embrace it. Can I stop AI? No. Can you stop it? No. Now, so what, what's the choice here? What exactly are we talking about? Can you stop the iPhone? Well, can you stop mobile telephony? No. Can you stop Bluetooth? No. Why? Because it's convenient. It's clearly something that humans are embracing. So if, if this makes human life better for whatever reason, because you want to be communicating with other people, people want a variety of stages on which they can show who they are, that's Facebook, people, people want to share the moment, and that's fa forward-facing camera. You know, we take selfies. <laughs> this is what we are about. So... It's true that we cannot stop it. And I'm, I'm like a techno optimist, largely, right? So I believe that in the long run, these would be for, for the positive, right? So every technology, if you look at it as improved the quality of our life, the way we live historically, right? And I believe this is so as well with AI. However, I believe there is a difference between this technology and every other technology that we had so far, meaning uh, this technology could uh, potentially make decisions on its own, right? We're not there yet, so you still need humor inputs. But, you know, I've been playing around with some uh, AI agents. Uh, there are like, they are starting, you know, to pop up. They can sort of... Uh, make sort of rudimentary decisions based on, you know, some inputs that you give that you give it and execute increasingly complex tasks, right? So it's not just generate an image, but it is generate an image and then publish it, turn it into a digital product and sell it. So that's the overall, the overall gist. And it's, I think it's 
almost sure that this is going to have an impact on, you know, the the job market, uh, um, future of professions, uh, right? And while I think that AI is an incredible opportunity for the individuals, uh, I see society as a whole, right? Uh, so co the collectivity, heal prepared uh, to handle this uh, from a corporation that, you know, don't know how to do it because there is the concern regarding data privacy and data ownership to governments that still organize everything around the concept of work, right? The normal nine to five employed job, right? So how can the society, the collective side, embrace technology, new technology, or technology such as this one, right? I don't want to give a prescription to uh, people in society because they need to go through this mourning phase. They are going through this, uh, uh, you know, five stages of grief. So they have to actually learn how to let go of a couple of things. But... One of the things you need to do is be optimistic, learn as much as you can about it, not, not with a sense of danger, but try to see this, the opportunity in everything. And I think it's very easy to focus on the danger and say it will kill us all. What exactly will be the benefit <laughs> for AI to kill us all? Like, why would AI want to kill us? And nobody's actually explained uh, this the answer to this question. People that are afraid of AI at one point ending humanity, don't articulate the intent. Like, why would AI do that? But can AI work without electricity? I don't know. <laughs> so, I don't know. Can we unplug it? Sure. <laughs> but did we show any inkling of unplugging anything else before, which we knew was killing us? Don't forget, the thing that killed more people than anything is called the knife. So then you realize, wait a second, am I afraid of what? Because, you know, too much penicillin can kill you as well. So it's not the thing itself that can kill you, it's the intent. So now, who designs the intent? Well, somebody who benefits always. What is the, the benefit of... So my attitude towards this is always, how can I use it? How can I become a better human with it? Exactly the way I dealt with computers, the way I dealt with uh, uh, floppy disks, <laughs> which people might not know what they are, <laughs> the way I dealt with the pixels and, you know, uh, I, I haven't seen a lot of people complaining that uh, the digital camera has put Kodak out of business or Fujifilm or, you know, I haven't seen anybody complaining that Polaroid has disappeared, but hey, now Polaroid is back. Oh my God, amazing. Humanity is back. Polaroids. We can take Polaroids. Really? Yeah. How as a business, uh, you know, can you take advantage of these technologies and survive and thrive furthermore, as opposed to being swept away by it? Well, which is the case for some industries, uh, right? Uh, so like you think about, I don't know, Customer service is a likely candidate uh, to be fully replaced. There are others, of course. Sure. And then you realize that this, the jobs that came... So the first place where automation goes is in repetitive work, right? And mm -hmm. we are totally fine with that. In the moment in which automation goes into uh, autonomous type systems in which they can actually think for you, and then you start displacing people which are customer service people with bots, which is the case of this app. Uh, this Squadcast has a bot who's not able to answer any questions, but gave me all the wrong links when I asked about how to change the background. What is the alternative to have a human at the other end waiting for you to ask a question, right? Mm -hmm. So essentially that human has no other purpose except to wait for you to have a problem. So we are creating a world in which people need to respond to your problems. And then you are complaining when the people are displaced by a machine responding to your problems. 
when in the end you are the originator both of the machine and the person because you have problems <laughs> so you need the question <laughs> answered right so then you realize how could layers and layers of work that we call work today are actually completely unsatisfactory and lead to depression let's let's take that leap of faith that indeed some jobs are extremely extremely unsatisfactory for the human spirit being a cash register input person because you are a cash register operator right you're not a cashier <laughs> the cash is the machine <laughs> so you are there to intermediate to, to be an intermediary between the machine and the customer can you find a job less satisfactory? I mean, how do we get any satisfaction and meaning out of that job? And then you are saying, wow, I'm replacing that with a machine and it's self-checkout. And people go, oh, that's insane. That's not good. What will the people do? The people will stay yeah, home but, and raise their kids. Yeah. Yeah, but you see where, where the problem lies, right? Society, like the way the system is designed, does not care about this uh, it does it's geared towards uh, full employment so i don't care what job you do right Just if do, it do makes something. you profoundly yeah, yeah. It, it makes you profoundly unhappy or is dehumanizing i don't care right yeah. just do something i just yeah, want yeah. full employment because this is the way that we create value and uh, we keep society in order yeah uh, that, right? that's a lot of part yeah that's how we keep order we keep order by giving people the impression they have meaningful work. Yes, right. Uh, That's right. So, so, it's a, so it's a play. So it's a play. It's a game. Uh, yes, it is a game. Uh, in, a, right. in, a, in a sir, in a sense, yeah. yes, it is. So, but I'm glad you got to this point because it is a game. It has rules. So once we change the rules of the game and the metrics of the game, which is something we created. It's something that we can recreate and we can redesign. This is what needs to take place. And this is not the first time we did this. We did this after the Second World War. We did it before the, like, we kept changing the game. And it took a long time for people to understand that, that initially, whoa, what right do you have to change the game? Well, we call it, we have to give it a name. So we call it a revolution. So let's call it the Bolshevik Revolution to give it a name and a destination. Whoa, that's amazing. Do you realize that that changed the game completely? Oh no, let's not call it the Bolshevik Revolution. Let's call it the French Revolution. Or let's call it the Industrial Revolution. Oh my God. So see, the word revolution allows us to actually implement these changes, <laughs> right? It's an ideology more than anything else, right? So we use words to transform our being. Fantastic. Like we do that all the time. Like humans believe in God. Some. Uh, I mean, a lot of them. Uh, uh, think that's impossible to exist. You know, so, but we built a space in our mind and we say, you know what? If it exists, I gain everything. If it doesn't, I lose nothing. So that's Pascal's bet. So, so I'm, I'm going to bet it exists. Fantastic. So why don't you bet that human life is not about work? <laughs> In other words, we do this all the time. So we know how, no, we, meaning all of us, we know how to do this. We understand that this is a game. But sometimes it's convenient to forget. Okay. Alexander. Anyway. Yes. Is there a rabbit hole that you would like to go and we didn't go into yet? No, I think we did a lot of good. Because I think we, we explored uh, the depth of uh, the despair and they gave people a tool to get out of it. So, Alexander, thank you so much for your, for your time and for your incredible insights today. Your book, uh, Transcending uh, Imagination, Artificial Intelligence, and the Future of Creativity, How Will AI Reshape the, cre the Creative Process, uh, will come out on April 2024, if I'm yep. not mistaken. Yes. Okay. So we will put Available a link at your famous 
available at all online and other stores. <laughs> okay, we will put the links to these and all the resources that we mentioned in the show notes. That's all from today's episode. Thank you so much for watching or listening. If you find this episode valuable, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or to the Polyweb podcast on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast app. It would be fantastic if you could leave us a rating, a review, or a comment, as this really helps other listeners find the show. All the resources mentioned in this episode will be linked in the description and in the show notes. See you on the next episode. And if you cannot wait until next week, you can watch this episode right here that relates to some of the things that we talk about in this episode. Bye.